All right, so we've uh, just introduced last Friday the nervous system. Uh, and what we're going to pick up is dealing with the three basic steps. In the coordination process. So, this figure shows us the three basic steps in coordination. We have a sensory input, we have integration of that information coming in, and then we have a motor output, which you can also think of as the response to the stimuli or the sensation. So, we're going to call that sensory input collectively. We'll refer to it as the sensation. And we're going to use sensing organs, uh, your eyes, ears, taste, uh, and a whole bunch of other things that are embedded in skin and things like that to pick up information from the environment around us. Even things inside of some of our organs to pick up changes in that internal environment. Blood pressure changes, that information is collected by these sensory organs as a sensation and then gets sent to the central nervous system to be processed. Now, the thing that's really crazy about the sensation is the signal. It's not just simply that it's a signal that's sent back, turning, like, turning the light switch on or off, changing the light in the room. It's actually a signal that's coded. And it's a lot like, if you measure it, it's actually a lot like a barcode. And the reason that it's coded so that signal as it's passed through the central nervous system, that information embedded in the information that's coming in, embedded in the sensation that's coming in, can actually be determined from where it's coming from. Is it coming from your foot or from your hand? Is that information coming in? Is it a noxious stimuli or did your significant other just grab your hand and wants to hold it? So it gives that information to the central nervous system as a coded signal. And then in the central nervous system, the information is processed. Uh, you can call it integration, which leads towards dictation of a command. So command dictation, basically we have to figure out what we want to do about that signal. Central nervous system. The CNS is the portion of the nervous system that includes the brain and the spinal cord. And depending on the stimulus, both the brain and the, sti the spinal cord do process uh, sensory information. You're all familiar with the knee jerk reflex. You go to the doctor, you sit up on the table, he hits you with a hammer, and your leg should kick out. That is testing your reflex which is a response to a sensory input. Basically, when they tap the knee, the patellar tendon is really what they're contacting. And that patellar tendon has the appearance that it's lengthening really, really quickly. That can be very, very dangerous. If it's lengthening very quickly, it can cause damage to the limb, it can cause damage to the muscle. So that signal gets sent back in, and it actually doesn't go all the way to the brain. It's important enough to stop at the spinal cord, and I can eliminate almost a half a meter of travel that that information has to make. So the information comes into the spinal cord, it gets processed as, hey, the quadriceps is extending at an astronomically fast rate, we need to do something to counteract that so we can track it. And the signal gets sent back out for that muscle to be tracked. So spinal cord will process the information, so will the brain, depending on where the stimuli is coming from, where the stimulus is located, and what the stimulus actually is. So the central nervous system collects that data. And you literally have millions of pieces of data that are being processed by the central nervous system at any given moment. Right now, all of you are keeping track of your blood pressure, you're keeping track of your blood chemistry, you're keeping track of, of uh, the, the body temperature. You're also hearing my voice, you're seeing your surroundings, you're reading the board. All that information is coming in as a sensory input, and all of it is being processed by the central nervous system. And then we have to take that data and we have to make a decision on it. So we have to evaluate the data. 
And then once we've evaluated the data, we can go to a dictation of what needs to happen. So as I'm talking to you, there are airwaves that my vocal cords are disrupting that make their way to your ears, and you pick up those changes in the waves, the impulse in the sound waves, and process that information. And when I say the word bird, you hear the word bird, and you don't hear the word dog, or you hear the word whatever, because your brain processes it based off of experience and also the appearance of that sound wave, that information coming into the brain and says, oh, that's the word bird, and then gives you this motor response so that you can conceptualize that I just said bird. So we have to evaluate the data. We have to take a look at how we need to respond to, to go to this integration, this team command dictation, and then we actually have to take out that command. We have to, uh, we have to actually do that, and we call that the response. Typically, it's controlled by some sort of motor neuron uh, or a uh, neuron that leaves from the central nervous system and carries a set of information to glands and tissues and muscles to help you respond to the information that's coming in. Right now, you all are just sitting here nice and quiet. If I were to bring a bear in, you would see that bear, you would respond, you'd probably get up, push the small students down, and try to run away as fast as you can. So that would be your response. And it's all based off of that sensory information that comes in. So the response, the command is sent out, again, it's an electrical signal, sent out to places like glands and muscles. Basically being sent to the tissues and the organs that can help you respond. So we're going to initiate and propagate the proper response. So what would be the proper response if I were to put my hand on a hot burner? Pull that away. Hand goes on the hot burner. I have an action potential, or I have a signal, I should say. We'll get an action potential in a second. It is an action potential. But it's a signal that goes up to the spinal cord and says, your hand is being injured on a hot burner. That's processed by the central nervous system. The signal is sent back out very quickly to my bicep and other muscles in, uh, in my arm to say, pull your hand away. And it happens so quickly so as to reduce and eliminate the damage to my hand. These are my livelihood, right? So I'm protecting the tissue. So that's the basic process, and there's a bunch of different responses and sensory input. I've given you just a couple of them, and we can talk about many, many more that occur every day on a routine basis. What I'd like to do now is take a look at the whole nervous system and begin to identify what parts of the nervous system deal with bringing sensory information into the central nervous system, and what parts of the nervous system deal with bringing that motor output or that response output back out to the individual. So this schematic is just detailing your central ner or your, uh, your nervous system as a whole, and basically at each level you have different divisions, and each of these different divisions have different responsibilities. So I first want to deal with this first division here, central versus peripheral, beginning with the central nervous system. So central nervous system abbreviated CNS. And the central nervous system is going to be the tissue of the brain and of the spinal cord. And these two tissues are protected 
by the cranial and the vertebral cavities. Cavities. I don't know what a cavity is. So encased in the cranial and vertebral cavities. The other side is the peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, is all of the other nervous tissue outside of the central nervous system. So all of the other nervous tissue outside of the central nervous tissue. And it's going to primarily be comprised of two types of tissues. The nerves themselves, which are bundles of the individual cells of the nervous system called neurons. So neurons are the individual cell. They're bundled together in what are called nerves. And there are a bunch of peripheral nerves that basically bring information to and from the extremities and everything outside of the central nervous system. Now, in particular, the portion of the neuron, and we're going we're gonna to take a look here in just a second at what a neuron looks like. Uh, the nerves are wrapped up axons. This is one portion of a neuron. So there's your central nervous system. Here is the peripheral nervous system. And you have all of these nerves. And if you were to dissect those nerves, you would find cells that have sort of a star-like shape like this, and then a really long filament that ends in a termination. Okay? This is called the soma. This is where the nucleus of the cell is. This is called the axon. And then down here at the bottom is the synapse. So a peripheral nerve is going to be bundles of all of these axons from several or many different neurons, all bundled together, traveling to one local region in the organism. Those axons are also re referred to as a nerve fiber. But just think about that as being the level of the cell. So we take this long axon, bundle it together, and then we may have neurons, individual cells wrapped up in nerves that travel a great distance, meters in length in some individuals, or a meter in length in some individuals coming from the spinal cord going all the way down to the muscles in my feet. That was all one long neuron, one long individual cell wrapped up with a bunch of other individual cells to form the nerve. Okay, so that's one part of the central, of the, I'm sorry, peripheral nervous system. The other part is called the ganglion. Looks like ganglion, but it's ganglion. And the ganglion is clumped tissue. that actually contains the cell body. So up here, cell body. So you're going to have another location. It's actually going to be located right along here. Another picture that will help to kind of show this. So this is the just a small little chunk of the spinal column here with a peripheral layer leading, leading away. And so we're going to have this small clump of tissue here called the ganglion. And that ganglion, uh, or that clump of tissue, is going to contain those cell bodies. So you can see here in blue would be the axon, and red would be the axon, and then we have our cell bodies contained here within that ganglion. Now this peripheral nervous system is 
where we're going to get our input for sensory signals. And we'll get to it in just a second here. We also get our output for what we call motor signals. Starting here with the input or sensory signals. Where can we get these input or sensory signals from? Well, we can get them from our surroundings, which I'm going to call our exterior environment. So right now, you're all probably relatively comfortable, maybe a little bit warm, if you like the temperature a little bit high in the room today. Why are you making that response? Because you're picking up that information from your surrounding environment. You all know that there's a bank of lights on because you're picking up that information from your surrounding environment. You know that there's approximately 15 students in the room because you're picking that up from your external environment. So those are all examples of inputs that are information incoming to central nervous system, to the peripheral nervous system. The sensory signals also can come from the internal environment. And these internal signals are going to deal with the condition of tissues. What is your internal body temperature? What does your blood chemistry look like? How much urine is in your bladder? What does your blood pressure look like? All of this information is also tracked by the central nervous system. One last thing that the peripheral nerves do is to keep track of your movement and position. So movement and positional signals. So right now you all are aware that you're sitting down. If we were to skew those signals and you didn't know if you were sitting up, sitting up uh, down or standing up, well maybe we would skew them. And you didn't know if you would completely step down off of the stair, it could cause you to fall or cause other bad things that could lead towards damage of your tissue. So we also want to keep track of where we are within our three-dimensional environment. So those are all of the input and sensory signals. The peripheral nervous system will also deal with output or motor signals. Input are obviously signals that come in. Output are signals that are going to be passed from the central nervous system out to the tissue. So really in the reverse direction. Now if I go back just a couple slides here to that uh, figure that has the divisions, you'll notice that from the peripheral nervous system, I now have two additional divisions here. The autonomic nervous system and the somatic. The output from the peripheral nervous system can be divided into a somatic division and into an autonomic division. The somatic division is going to be signals that get sent to the skeletal muscle. Somatic division is the signaling for the skeletal muscle function. On the other side, we have this thing called the autonomic nervous system. You can think of that as being automatic. The autonomic nervous system I said you could think of it as being automatic. The reason you can think of it as being automatic is because it is under subconscious control. You don't really need to think about the responses that occur from the autonomic nervous system. You don't have to control them. And I'm going to give you an example here in just a second of what I'm talking about.
So it's under subconscious control. My somatic, I can make decisions. If I want to walk to the door right now, I can choose to walk towards the door. If I want to turn and walk towards y'all, I can choose to turn to, I can choose to turn and walk towards it. So I'm making that decision. I'm making the decision where I want to go, how fast I want to get there. All of that is under my control. But there are things that I don't want to control because it would take up my entire day trying to control those things. I don't want to control when my heart beats. I don't want to control my respirations. I don't want to control how I regulate my blood pressure. I don't want to control the production of urine. All of that is under autonomic control. I don't have to sit here and say, okay, heart beat. It's under control where it happens automatically. So these nerves that are bound up in the autonomic nervous system, many of them go to things like the heart, the intestines for movement, to the respiratory system for breathing. And you can probably think of several others. Now, if we take the autonomic nervous system, we can go one step further. And you can see that there's a division for sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, think of these as being opposing to each other. Sympathetic is opposite from parasympathetic and vice versa. So these are going to be opposing control systems. And I'm going to give you an example of how they're opposing in just a second here. Make sure that we have done the notes. Parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Okay, to make the distinction between parasympathetic and sympathetic, think parasympathetic calms. Sympathetic elevates and prepares the organism. Okay? So, sympathetic nervous system, I'm out in the woods, I come around the corner, and there's a huge bear standing there. I don't want to be calm at this point. I want to be able to respond. Not that he's an immediate threat, but I want to become prepared in case his bear decides to charge me. So I'm going to heighten my heart rate. I'm going to decrease urine production. I don't really need to be producing urine if I'm getting ready to fight a bear or run away from bear, right? I'm going to increase rate of respiration. My pupils are going to dilate. All of these tissues are now under sympathetic control. And they're preparing me to either turn and run or to climb a tree or to do something to evade this giant bear. Then I get away from the bear, everything's all good now, and everything calms back down. I begin to digest again, heart rate settles back down, respirations drop back down, my pupils constrict, and I'm basically going back into this normal state of relaxation. I don't have to bring up all this dangerous creature that we can work Okay. Yeah, um, if you want to designate it that way, you can designate it as being fight or, oh my gosh, how it's fright, fight, flee, a bunch of them now. But basically, yeah, it's the response to prepare to be able to take action or to prepare to be in a lower metabolic state where action is not so we're going to expend energy, but it's useful, or we're going to reduce our energy expenditure because we don't need to be in that heightened state of awareness or preparation for uh, fighting or fleeing or fighting or whatever. Let's take a look at neurons. Neurons, again, are the cells of the nervous system, or at least the main cells of the nervous system. We're going to find out there are a few other cell types in the nervous system. So these are the main cells in the nervous system. And I'm going to start out with some functions. So here's a, a picture. We'll come back to this anatomy in just a second. Uh, let's deal with some basic function first.
So these neurons, they basically have a very similar function to all of the other cells, but they have a higher magnitude of these functions. <coughs> so an increased magnitude or an increased order of this function. All of our cells can be excited, neurons can be excited really exceptionally well. And this idea of excitability is just the ability to respond to a stimulus. So excitable or respond to a stimuli. And what we're going to find out is the response of a neuron to a stimuli is to actually generate an electrical signal. And you can actually measure that electrical signal with something very similar to a voltmeter, which is pretty crazy. You know, you go and put the uh, voltmeter on the terminals of a battery and you can measure the voltage. You, know, you put it into a circuit, you can measure the current across that circuit. We can actually measure the same thing in all of our cells, but exceptionally well in our neurons. And in fact, some of the stuff that we understand about the electrical nature and the excitability of neurons, or of all cells, comes from neurons. And we originally looked at a lot of these things in the neuron of the giant squid. They have a neuron that runs from the location up in what sort of looks like their head, it's not really their head, but sort of looks like their head all the way down to the tips of their tentacles. So these are hugely long cells. Now they're very, very narrow, so it's not a huge thing to think of, but it's at least very, very long and easier to work with, and we were able to measure these excitability characteristics and begin to understand how we actually create this response to a stimuli. A second function of a neuron is to be conductive. Again, all cells have the property of conductivity, which is just simply able to pass information from yourself to a surrounding cell, but the neuron does it really, really well and passes that signal as an electrical signal. So we can pass a signal down the cell or across the cell to surrounding tissues really well. So we exhibit a high level of conductivity. The last characteristic is this characteristic called secretion, which is the ability to release molecules to surrounding cells. In this case, we're going to specifically call these neurotransmitters. And we've already run into neurotransmitters at one other place. Anyone happen to remember where we ran into neurotransmitters previously? Yeah, with muscle contraction. And how did we how do we use neurotransmission in muscle contraction? Do you remember? Okay, so we packaged up acetylcholine into a vesicle in the neuron, and we released it into that thing called the synapse, and it interacted with the muscle cell. And the mechanism that we used to, to deliver the acetylcholine into the synapse, if you remember what that was called? It's a bulk transport. It was exocytosis. So neurons are really good at secreting through exocytosis a variety of different molecules. One of those molecules is acetylcholine. But you may recognize others that we call neurotransmitters. Dopamine, serotonin, GABA. These are all examples of molecules that certain neurons are able to secrete from the very tips, or what we call the synapse, of the neuron. Everybody good here? So let's deal real quickly with the anatomy. 
So this is an example of a neuron. And again, the length of the neuron, some of them are really, really short. But some of them are very long. And it depends on what, what that neuron is doing and where it's going. From the spinal cord down to the muscles in my toes, that's all one set. So it's all one neuron with a really long axis. The neurons that go from one side of the spinal cord to the other that integrate the motor to the sensory or the sensory to the motor are very, very short. But they still have the basic, the same basic anatomy. So what you're looking at on this side, this sort of star-shaped part of the cell. And forgive my drawing here, I'm not the best artist, but that's what you're stuck with. So it sort of looks a little bit like that. And then we have these filaments that come off these points up here. Yeah, that's half that. But the big star-shaped structure here is called the soma or the cell body. It's going to contain the nucleus, mitochondria, and other organ. Okay? So this is the soma. And then these points of kind of branching that come off of each of these little tips of the star, which you can see in here, those are called the dendrites. And those dendrites are basically points of contact or communication with surrounding cells. So you can see in this figure here, I have a whole nother neuron that comes in and interacts with various locations on this soma and on these dendrites. Now, this is the end of the neuron. It's not another soma. It's actually the opposite end on the neuron soma. For this cell here, it would be someplace up here. OK, so nucleus, mitochondria, all that stuff is in there. And then we have this big, long filament that we call the axon. Okay? And in this case, the axon, you can see, has these little surrounding things. These are individual cells that basically get wrapped up around that axon. And it's a lot like taking a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and the other cell that wraps around the axon just kind of wraps up, folds around itself like that. And you end up with a cell that wraps around many, many times and it sort of pushes the nucleus. The nucleus ends up getting pushed up into one little section of, uh, of that particular cell. Um, not all cells are going to have this Lining. This lining is called uh, the, the myelin sheet, and we'll talk about myelin and myelinated fibers. So some fibers are going to be blank like this one, or they may have those Schwann cells that make up the myelination that runs the length of the axon. We'll come back and talk more about what that actually does. Just sort of looking ahead, think about electrical wire that has plastic over it to be an insulator. Same thing is happening here. At the very end, we have this branching-like structure, and it's called a variety of different things. The whole thing, so the whole branching structure is typically called the terminal arborization. And this is basically the terminal branch. This terminal arborization ends up in these little knobs or buds or what best should be called synapses. And the synapse is going to be that point of contact that can be made with another cell. Could be another neuron, or could be like we saw in muscle, uh, uh, interfaces with the neuromuscular with the neuromuscular junction with the motor end plate. This is where the neurotransmitters are released onto the other cell. Now, when you look at neurons, you actually have different classifications of neurons. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. Biologists love to classify things. Neurons are no exception, so we have classes of neurons, and I want to give you three different classes to be aware of. And they're functional classes. They're basically what these neurons do. So we have some neurons that are sensory neurons. And our sensory neurons are the neurons that 
that accept information from sensory organs or receptors. Basically accepts information from both the internal and external environments. And it's the responsibility of the sensory neuron, you can see that here on the bottom, sensory organs here in the skin, these are probably something like uh, proprioceptors that respond to uh, touch and feel and pain. That information or impulse is sent back into the central nervous system by these sensory organs and receptors. So these neurons are responsible to initiate the signal. Basically, signal initiation is the idea that we take that stimuli and that stimuli creates or helps to generate the, uh, the signal that's going to be passed into the central nervous system. The second class of neurons is what we have here in the spinal cord itself. So inside the spinal cord, we have these really small little neurons. They're called inner neurons. And the inner neurons are the in-between. They will accept the information from the signal from the sensory neurons, and they will help to process and dictate the response. Then the inner neuron takes that response and says, OK, that's my wife's hand, so I'm not going to try to pull away. Here. Or that's not my wife's hand. It's a hot stove burner. I better pull away. If I leave it here, that's going to be here. Takes that information, determines what needs to happen, and sends that information out onto our third class of neuron, which are the motor neurons. And the motor neurons are the neurons that are responsible to actually undertake that response. So it might be muscle contraction. I'm pulling my hand away from a hot burner, contract forcefully my biceps to get away from that object. So I'm holding my wife's hand. More loving. So up to this point, I've said we generate signals, generate signals, generate signals several times. So now I'm going to actually take you through the process of generating the signal. How do we actually take sensory information, convert it into the language of the neurons, and utilize that to control how we're going to react to those stimuli? In order to understand signal generation, we have to understand some electronics. And some of this you should be somewhat familiar with, but maybe not in the terms that I'm going to give it to you. The first thing I want to talk about is an electrical potential. Now, an electrical potential is basically, or can basically be thought of as a difference in the concentration of electrically charged particles across some sort of barrier. In our biological system, that barrier is going to be a metric. I'm going to start out easier, and I'm going to give you a pattern. Okay? So real quick, I want to draw a battery. Okay. Inside of a battery, you know, you're going to have the positive side, and you're going to have the negative side. You put it in your flashlight or your little kid's toy. Voila, it works. Why does it work? It's because that battery has a potential. It has a difference in concentration of charged particles on either side of a barrier, and I can use that potential to cause work. Turning on the flashlight causing the light bulb to illuminate, or causing the little wheels on a kid's toy to rotate around. So inside of a battery, if we were to dissect the battery, what we would find is there's a little membrane right in the middle. 
And it's not always like that. Sometimes it's a membrane that kind of goes like this, but you get the point. I have two different compartments. And in those compartments, I have two different chemicals. And you probably are familiar with some of those chemicals. You probably heard of a nickel cadmium battery. Maybe you've heard of a lithium chloride battery. Those are the two different chemicals. So one of them is going to be loaded up on one side. The other is going to be loaded up on the other side. Now, in the terms of a battery, the charged particle that's going to move is going to be the electrons. In those relationships, nickel, cadmium, lithium chloride, those chemicals, one of them is really good at giving up electrons, and one of them is really good at accepting electrons. So on one side, I can put in a whole bunch of chemicals that are really good at giving up electrons. That's my negative side. On the other side, I have a whole bunch of molecules that are really good at accepting the electrons. Those are the positive side. And then I put a little circuit in there. So I have a wire, and then I have my light bulb, and then I have the other side of the circuit attached up to the positive. Now, when I flip a switch or when I plug everything in, those electrons begin to leak through here. They move through the filament to cause light to begin to illuminate, and they travel over here towards the positive side. It's really good at giving off electrons. The only way the electrons can be given up is to go around that barrier. You can't go through the barrier. You go around the barrier. And in the process, because those electrons like to go from where they give, are given up to where they like to be or like to be accepted, they create this thing called current. So we're using the electrical potential of the battery to generate this thing called current. Current is just simply going to be movement of charged particles across that barrier or around that barrier. Okay? Just like a river, current is movement of water from one location to another location. So how do we apply that electrical potential? By the way, electrical potential, anyone know what we measure that in based off of what I just gave you? <coughs> measure that in volts. So this characteristic uh, measurement called volts or voltage is the measurement, the difference between the charges on either side. A AA battery is 1.5 volts. So it has a 1.5 volt potential. And I can use that 1.5 volt potential to allow electrons to flow through my circuit to cause work to happen, lighting up the light bulb or cause computers on a little toy to move so the toy works. The current that moves through there a lot of times is referred to as amperage, and you measure it in amps. And we actually can begin to apply this system here to our cells. And we can begin to look for the similarities, and we can see the voltage, the electrical potential, and then we can also begin to figure out how we can generate current or amperage. Now, in terms of a cell, we don't use volts and amps. We actually use millivolts and milliamps which is only a difference of a thousand per voltage. So if I go from volts to millivolts, one volt is a thousand millivolts. One amp is a thousand millivolts. So we're just shifting the magnitude of the system. Okay, so our electrical potential, it's a difference in concentration, that's awful. It's a difference in concentration of electrically charged particles. So in our battery, we have things like nickel cadmium or nickel metal, uh, nickel metal hydride. We have two different chemicals on either side of the barrier. In our cells, we actually are going to have what are called ions or electrons. And the most common are potassium, which is K. And it's got a little positive charge. I'm going to tell you about that positive charge in just a minute. And the other is sodium, which also has a positive charge. Inside of all of our cells, we also have things called immovable anions. These are negatively charged molecules that are too big to cross through the membrane. 
It includes things like DNA. DNA has an overall negative charge. Proteins have overall negative charge. A lot of our acids have an overall negative charge. So if I were to draw this picture up here, what I would draw is something that looks like this, where I have my extracellular fluid on this side, my intracellular fluid on this side. I have this big negative influence on the inside of the cell because of the DNA, the RNA, of the RNA, the proteins, ATP, acids that all have a negative charge. And then I distribute those two ions, the potassium and the sodium. The potassium is much higher in concentration outside of the cell, much lower in concentration on the inside. That's why it's really smaller. The potassium is much higher on the inside and much lower on the outside. Okay? So this is a basic schematic of what our cells look like from an ion distribution perspective. Now, let's see how well you've been paying attention over the last couple of weeks. If I have concentration differences from one location to another, what do I call them? A concentration gradient. And that concentration gradient we can use to predict how potassium would move if we were to make the barrier what we call permeable to potassium. So how would I move potassium across this membrane if the membrane became permeable to potassium? We always go from high concentration to low concentration. So we'll go in that direction for potassium. We'll go in that direction for sodium. Now, check this out. If I cause a bunch of sodium to rush into the cell, what happens to the overall charge inside of the cell? I'm taking a bunch of positively charged molecules and I'm putting it in this space. We're going to become more or less positive. More positive. How about with potassium? If I take potassium and I flow potassium out through the membrane, what happens to the charge inside of the cell now? It becomes more negative. This becomes a bigger influence. So now I have the ability to move sodium and potassium in and out of the cell. Just like in my battery, I could move my electrons through that circuit. I could use that circuit to generate current, which could be used to do work. Now going through the membrane, which I'm going to use these things called channels to do this, I can open up a channel which makes the membrane permeable. And I can move sodium and potassium into and out of the cell, which is movement of ions or movement of charged particles across the barrier, which is called current. And current can be used to perform work. I need the electrical potential, which is really the concentration difference and the influence of the negative for those molecules to move in a predictable fashion. Now, what's, what's the biggest problem when you're out camping? It's when your flashlight doesn't work because your batteries are dead. So why would batteries be dead? You've reduced the electrons or the ability of those molecules to release electrons on one side of the barrier enough that there's no longer a perceptible membrane potential to generate a good, uh, a good current for work. Okay, So we call the battery dead. If I were to equalize my sodium and my potassium so I didn't have those concentrations, my membrane would be dead. I wouldn't have the proper potential to generate the proper current to do work. So we always want to maintain our electrical current <laughs> so that we can actually so that we can actually do work. And we call this a resting membrane potential. And we will pick up with resting membrane potentials on Wednesday when you come back.